Hey, 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 what's going on, everybody? Ryan Noopel here, Noop Sports Show, episode 216. It has been a while. I am glad to be back. I believe our last show was late 2023. So this is potentially the first show of 2024. I'm trying to rack my brain, but I'm excited to bring uh, bring you a bunch of new interviews with great leaders across the sports industry. Uh, that's what we do. That's what we enjoy. And I have a great lineup of people uh, set for 2024 that... Uh, we can bring you their story. That's what I enjoy doing. I enjoy telling people's story and, and what they're up to. So hopefully you've all been well. Hopefully you're enjoying the iGaming Next conference this week in New York City. Uh, I did not, uh, I was not able to attend this conference, unfortunately, but my brother is representing the Nuple brothers there. Um, so he's at the conference having a good time while I sit at home hanging out with kids and family. But uh, that's uh, that's another story for another day. Hopefully you're enjoying that show. All right, as I mentioned, we have a ton of great guests lined up, and we have an awesome one today that I'm super excited to get to know and get to know what their company's doing. So I'm going to go ahead and bring him on. Today we have Nick Kelland. Nick, how you doing? Nick's with Basketball Forever. How you doing, Nick? Good, man. Good to be here. 216 episodes is a uh, it's a pretty significant shift. It's good to have you back for the year as well. Yeah, man, it's been a, it's been a journey. That's over three or four years. So we've uh, we've kind of just strung a whole bunch together and and. Before you blink, you're at 216. You're like, whoa, how did we do that? So amazing yeah. to have you on. I'm, I'm super excited to to be here with you. I appreciate you having me. It should be fun. Awesome. Well, cool. Well, Nick, uh, you know, as we typically do, we like to dive into to you first. So I'd love to hear what makes you tick. Maybe, you know, where you've been in your career journey that kind of led you to where you are today. So why don't you give us a little bit about yourself? Yeah. Uh, so I live in New York. Originally, I'm from Australia. You can probably hear from the accent. Uh, my background... I guess was was carved out in sports media. Um, we, we went sort of a roundabout way back to where I am today, but started in sports media uh, essentially from when I was like 16, 17 years old, did the whole unpaid internship route and, you know, getting exposure to different pro sports setups back home. Um, eventually was working for a company called Channel 9 in Australia, was running their coverage of sort of like the Ashes, which is um, the biggest cricket tournament, if you want to call it that, in the world between Australia and England. Um, and then some stuff around like the FIBA World Cup. Uh, basketball has always been a big part of my life, but I've just been a sports nut. Moved from uh, sort of like the content creation side, I would say, in, in digital media and broadcast media. Just got very lucky to land a job at a company called Immutable back mm -hmm. home in, in Sydney. Uh, was sort of an early employee there. That company ended up growing quite fast. Came across to the States about two years ago um, and was looking at sort of business development and, and, and the strategy side of my career that was picking back up. Um, and then all of that sort of came to an inflection point around sort of nine months ago when Forever Network or, or Basketball Forever, which we'll, we'll get into, uh, had launched an iGaming product or a fantasy product, if you want to call it, um, that was doing gangbusters and the media scale was continuing to sort of blow up. So um, we raised some money, brought the business over to the States, and, and now I look after sort of the strategy side um, over here. So that's been my career in a, in a very, very short nutshell. <laughs> a very short nutshell, but I'm sure there was a, a lot of great experiences through that journey that uh, that led you there today. And, and you know, I want to dive right into where you're at today. So you mentioned Forever Network, uh, Basketball Forever. Um, give us a little, you know, for those that haven't heard of Forever Network or Basketball Network, give us a the the ten thousand foot view of what the company is and what you guys uh, what you guys are up to. Yeah, so Forever Network is the the parent company of our flagship brand, Basketball Forever. Basketball Forever is a, a social sports publisher that was founded in <clears throat> excuse me founded in two thousand and fifteen back in Sydney, Australia. Um, and in the last nine years, we've grown that digital account that that sort of independent media publisher head to be the number one ranked global sports media company amongst millennials by engagement. Um, and, you know, we say millennials is a bit of a catch-all term. It's, it's loosely sort of like 18 to 35, 36 years old. <laughs> um, you know, we've grown that, that masthead uh, with a sort of distributed social model around 20 to, you know, 25% year on year uh, in subscriber and, and follower metrics. And we've now reached a sort of critical mass on the audience side with basketball specifically. So last year in the in the 2022-23 NBA season we did 4 billion content impressions um and we were really proud to reach sort of 260 million people unique across the world um and so that was sort of i, I guess how the business has started and scaled over the last 8 years we've got a really really talented team of creators and 
you know, people who work across visual design and illustrative features and different pieces on that side. Uh, so we built sort of critical scale there. And then the reason we, I guess like where, where we got connected and, um, you know, the capital we've raised over here and where we're now moving is we're, we're pivoting the business or moving it from more of like a media focused independent media approach into uh, a native product experience company. So, um, specifically operating in the fields of sort of like eye gaming and fantasy. So mm. we launched a, um, a beta of a, a non-real money pick em, really, really simple uh, concept. Essentially, you know, every morning you would, you would log into the application, uh, you would have five binary, you know, questions that were presented as digital trading cards. Uh, there were no monetization rails. It was, it was very much just to, to get a temperature check on how our audience liked to sort of transact and where they liked, liked to dedicate their energy on sort of like an owned and operated uh, second screen. Mm -hmm. um, but the interesting thing we built with this pick -in was that the markets were dictated not by sort of, you know, data feeds and, and betting APIs. They were dictated by what was trending in the media ecosystem. And we used that as our sort of like ability to acquire users at very, very low cost um, to build that sort of like, you know, I guess UA or and retention flywheel. Uh, the beta did extremely well. We realized that we had sort of significant product market fit at scale in, in sort of a number of global regions. Uh, and that was enough for us to go and sort of raise raise capital with some really, really good investors over here, both sort of from an angel standpoint and then a couple of institutional checks. Um, and our goal is basically to launch a suite of disruptive and sort of really unique fan engagement games. And the idea is that we want to capture and engage this global audience of sort of mobile first multi-screen sports lovers um, funnel them into a product that sort of taps into that cycle. Um, and then obviously what comes with that is expanding the international business operation, looking at new media opportunities, mm -hmm. new you know, B2B partnership opportunities, but you know, we reach 45 million US people a month. We reach <clears throat> 35 million people in the Philippines a month. You know, we're at significant sort of audience scale in, Canada, Australia, Europe, Latin America, Brazil, Mexico, you name it. So uh, the ability now, we've, we've sort of done the hard work to be able to get to that point. And now it's about trying to build really, really interesting product experiences that monetize in a smart way uh, moving forward. Wow. Yeah. That, congrats on all the success with the brand and the brands that go along with it. I have so many questions, but a couple just really high level basic questions. One, explain to the audience the because because I noticed on Basketball Forever, I mean, very NBA focused, right? Very NBA focused uh, brand. Explain for us in the U.S. that maybe aren't familiar with like Australian culture or something like that. The NBA interest over in like Australia has to be big as well, correct? Just uh, give me a little bit of cultural uh, education. Yeah. There is it is it a huge sport over in Australia as well. Everyone sort of, I, I think. I'll, I'll preface it by saying that I think Australian basketball has been put more on the map or considering our sort of, I guess, like global success in the last few years. Yeah. We obviously got a bronze medal at the last Olympics, but yep. we've got, you know, Australia has had multiple number one draft picks yep. uh, throughout history. You know, Kari Irving was born in, in Australia. Um, Andrew Bogart, obviously Ben Simmons. You've got new guys like Josh Giddy, people like that who are sort of, you know, flying the flag a little bit, but we now have sort of double digit players in the NBA who are sure. Australian born and raised. Um, but more importantly, from a viewing standpoint, uh, Australia is now the most popular sport in, uh, sorry, basketball is now the most popular sport in the country by pure oh. participation numbers. Um, cool. You know, supersedes cricket, um, supersedes soccer, everything. And from an NBA watching perspective, there's two things that make it so big and so successful there. So one is, we are per capita the biggest consumers of NBA league pass in the world. Um, so it's, a, it's, it's like a bit of a sleeping giant, I would say, but you wake up at, you know, 9am in Sydney, Australia, or, you know, 6am in Perth, wherever you may be. And the NBA is on all workday, right? So like you have really, really prime time viewing hours. And that's actually the reason that our content team still sits in Australia because you get the East coast and the West coast coverage. And then through the afternoon and the evening, uh, we can touch all those things. Whereas if you're an East Coast based basketball reporter in the US or, you know, you're covering the sport from New York, you know, some of those games out in Denver will finish at one in the morning, right? One sure. thirty in the morning, depending on, you know, you got a single or double OT and then you have presses. <laughs> and so, yeah, Australia is just like, it's a really nice melting pot, both from a, a growing popularity piece, um, a propensity to want to spend both time and money on these things. 
and then obviously the viewing time. And then I'll bookend all of that by saying that Australia is, um, you know, anyone who's in this industry understands that Australia is like, you know, I, I like to call it sort of the gambling capital of the world. <laughs> the buyers, but, you know, we, we've been betting on mobile phones for 15, 20 years, right? We've, yeah. in many ways, the landscape has been paved uh, there with a lot of stuff. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, again, from a GDP standpoint, we, we are some of the biggest gamblers in the world. So basketball <laughs> is a very, very like repeatable, um, gambling sure. upon product. So, yeah. Cool. Well, thank you for that education. Appreciate it uh, for sure. And and it is really, really interesting to see the growth of, you know, the sport worldwide. And, and when you name some names and some things like that, it kind of, oh yeah, you're right. Like there is so much presence outside of the United States worldwide in this sport now that, uh, you know, really started in the United States, but now has just grown to be a global just monster. Crazy, crazy to think about. So yeah, appreciate sure. that uh, for sure. Um, so chief strategy officer, obviously in charge of kind of the strategy to grow business across the network and across the sites. But I want to talk a little bit about, and, and maybe you don't know a bunch of this, but I'm curious, you know, when people think of a media network, typically there's like one channel that kind of like, okay, they're, they're man, they're heavy on Instagram or they got started here. I'm curious where you guys got your, I don't know if I want to call it big break or where you started or how that you know, was it all of these channels in one and just grew this massive brand or was it like, no, we started on Snapchat and that's where we got big and now we're kind of across channels? Because I noticed you guys have huge Instagram following, huge Facebook following, tons of social stuff. You got a website presence. I'm curious kind of from a beginning side where the Forever Network kind of got going. Yeah. I mean, CEO of the business who's literally been there since the day they we set up like the Instagram handle back in 2012 or whatever <laughs> it was. Um, I think, I think his theory was always that he saw a different way to present, um, I guess like sporting news and, and highlights and, and cultural yeah. narratives of what was going on in the sport. Um, he knew that it could be like very visual, very snackable, very storytelling. And that came at a time where sports media was very web property focused. It was very text heavy, mm. um, you know, and I guess like the, the D to C side and in, in terms of the way that you wanted to consume media was quite limited. So um, it definitely lent itself in the beginning sort of early days to visual platforms. I think that's why we've grown to significant scale on, on Instagram and Facebook. They're our two biggest platforms. We've got, you know, 7 million probably cross platform uh, on those two, but um, you know, now we lean more heavily into video. We obviously have a podcast that does really well. Um, mm. Our last episode got sort of over a million views for the first time, which is, you know, we're, we're getting to a point now where we're experimenting with, I guess, new media verticals um, and new ways to present interesting storylines. But ultimately, a lot of it sort of pushes towards an apex point where we're trying to work out how to continually engage and retain people in like an owned and operated app structure. Um, so it's sort of, it's an experiment and a case study in learning how to take people from this really, really like deep, you know, best in class visual design language coverage of the game um, you know, speed to news, speed to content delivery, getting them from that where they've been baked in for, you know, some people have been following this brand for 10 plus years now. It's a part of the way that they consume the sport. Yeah. Getting them from that into, okay, we now have you transacting and playing and doing things on an even deeper level, right? So, um, yeah, it's a, sort of a long-winded way to answer the yeah. question, but it was, it was, it was all, it lent itself very visual. So that's why Facebook and Instagram grew to a significant scale before, everything else uh, and the website backfilled over the last sort of four, four years. Yeah, sure. I'm sure it's been a journey down this path to get to where it is today. You know, people see some of these channels and oh, five million, like it looks so easy to do. And I'm sure it's just been a, a grind and a journey. Uh, it sounds like over a 10 year journey to get, you know, this company yeah. this amount yeah. of views exactly. and things right. of that nature, you know, um, crazy. So let's dive back into the games and, and kind of where you're heading from that side of things. I know you did some really cool games around the NBA All-Star game and you have some new NBA games coming out. Uh, maybe you can dive a little deeper into some of these games, what they do, what they are, what they're for, things of that nature. Yeah, so we obviously had, had Vote, which I sort of uh, touched on earlier in the piece, which is a, it's it's essentially like a our take on a pick em, um, yeah. a pick em game um, with things like trading mechanics, burn mechanics, uh, and the ability to sort of um, interact on a, on a deep community level instead of, you know, trading picks, trading questions, trading cards that you've unlocked and answered, 
burning them in exchange for discounts in fan stores, for prizes, memorabilia, giveaways. And then obviously um, the vision is in the sort of short term as we full launch that product to have monetization rails um, on that game itself. So that's mm-hmm. one. The second we launched at, at All-Star Weekend is, is our sort of proprietary piece of tech called Hot Hand. Um, it's a live action basketball bingo game, which we were really, really pleased with. We had, you know, more than 10,000 players on night one for that product. Um, essentially the way that game works is you generate a five by five uh, bingo square of player props at different varying odds and probabilities. And then your goal is to complete a line of five, either diagonally, horizontally, or vertically. Uh, mm. And those tiles result in real time with really rich animation. Um, and if you're playing in a lobby of 10,000, you're playing for, you know, on that night we gave away 200 all-star jerseys. Uh, the top left, you can see what the supply is that's left as it whittles down and you're sweating one prop where you're like, I need power bank here to get one more rebound for me to sneak into this first 200. Um, and then he gets benched and it's like, but it's a, it's a really, uh, I think it's a really interesting product with a lot of like long-term scalability. Yeah. Uh, our goal is to have that in market with essentially, um, you know, that product live on, on every single NBA game as we get to the playoffs um, and the ability to play in like micro time as well. So play a second half bingo card, um, a full game bingo card, quarter bingo cards uh, at different price points. So essentially thinking of it as like almost a raffle mechanic um, is really interesting to us. The goal there is just to bookend that bit. The goal there is to make that a very, very social game. So you obviously have like the game itself, you have the ability to make money from it. It, it sort of resembles a, a level of, of like betting, you know, it, there's a betting experience there. But ultimately, I think the real value of that and the stickiness is going to come from buying in for, you know, between 5 and $10 a night across a couple of different games and then sweating those entries out in like a live sort of community chat environment. Um, yep. I think that there's going to be like a lot of fun that comes from that. And then the third one, which is currently in development, is a game called Streaker, which is basically live action prediction. Cool. Um, you know, next basket, make or miss, um, trying to, you know, string three, four or five together to multiply odds. Uh, that one's probably going to resemble a betting experience more heavily than the first two, I would say. Mm-hmm. Um, but the goal is for us to build out this suite of, you know, four or five games over the next 12 months, um, get a sort of, you know, user base of 100,000 plus players monetized yeah. in ways that, they want to be monetized. So if your goal is just to play a pregame pick them, you can do that. If your goal is to be in the action on your mobile, the entire game doing live action stuff, you can do that. Uh, and if you want to keep it social and buy in for a buck or two, you can do that with like, you know, bingo games and different things. Yeah. So that's the way we think about it. Um, it's it's a lot of fun. I mean, yeah. the hot hang launch for us was like a real, real tick in the box. Um, yeah. And so now it's more about just continuing to build, partnering with the right people, being smart about going to market. That's amazing. So currently you're free to play Uh, in the future, looking at real money, you know, type activity. Uh, I know neither of us are lawyers, neither of us are in that space, but I'd be remiss to not talk about this a little bit with all the news coming out of some of these fantasy companies that are kind of getting pushed out of different states here. I know here in Florida, right, we have price picks and all these companies that now are getting kind of pushed out because they're considered gambling products and all of the above. I don't want to get into the details of that for you guys as a company, kind of diving into that space a little bit, how much of that do you have to really take into account and how much of a slippery slope is it for you guys as you start planning these products and how they operate? I mean, I I assume it's uh, there's a lot of strategy that has to go into that type of a launch, correct? Yeah, I think so there's, there's two elements to it. One is, um, in many ways, having prize picks and underdog and, and groups like that are, are very beneficial for us because um, I guess part of like blazing the trail, which they have done, is that they make a lot of the mistakes that we can go and learn from. Um, and we have all the respect in the world for those businesses, just like, you know, sure. have done unbelievable things for businesses like ours that are trying to build new and innovative yep. products. So we learn a lot from those. And then it's obviously just being, you know, doubly and triply sort of on top of, of legal opinions, um, making sure that what we're building is, is, is super compliant. Um, and then just, just understanding and taking haircuts where we have to and saying, all right, well, if we are going to have to, you know, if, if this product is only going to be played one 10 states for the time being, right, that's 10 states that we were above 12 months ago. Um, yeah. And I think we need to a point from an industry standpoint where, you know, you've seen it, I guess there's like analogs through, you know, recent history on the tech side, when there's a critical mass or there's enough 
people who are trying to play a product, play in a sandbox, play in an ecosystem, rules and regulations will get to a point where there's a level of uniformity. I just think because the space is so new, there's going to be groups that are making mistakes. Um, the goal is to not be one of those groups, but <laughs> ultimately, like, ultimately, we want to sort of, as much as we can, get close to towing the line with the way that we're aggressive with innovation um, and help move the industry forward. You know, I think we we take our responsibility as someone who's got like a big mouthpiece and a big sort of like media presence really seriously. Um, and so, as long as we stay true to that, then I think we'll be okay. Yeah, no, I think that's a great answer. And, and yeah, I, I agree with you. These companies have really, you know, brought a lot of a lot of attention to this type of a product and, and really have kind of grown that space. And man, it's just a, a it's a bummer to see what's happening to them. But like you said, everybody learns and everybody grows and, and kind of has to sometimes make those mistakes to move on to the next level of business. So it, it'll be interesting to see how all that shakes out. And, and I wish you guys luck as you go down that path as well. Um, Appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So uh, one other question here, I know we're kind of running out of time, but uh, while I have you, I'm curious uh, more on the affiliate marketing side and the affiliate side, because I'm assuming, you know, you guys with the amount of uh, people you have, attention you have, amount of traffic you get, I'm assuming are a very valuable affiliate. You're, you're uh, uh, probably coveted by a lot of these operators as a, as a good partner to work with, to be able to send traffic to these affiliates. I'm, I'm curious specifically your outlook on the affiliate world specifically in the u.s and how that's working um you know is it going well is it going to get better is it going to get worse how has that relationship been for you guys and and where is that headed it's an interesting one for us i mean we obviously see it as like a good green shoot for us on the revenue side um but ultimately you also need to toe the line between cannibalizing your own audience which you're yeah. trying to push into a new product um so the answer is yes, for sure. It's something that we, we look at very closely and we have done, you know, a couple of months of sort of soft affiliate testing, you know, you know, a handful of pushes, different things, but nothing from like a deep strategic side, mm. um, which has reaped, you know, good results. Um, mm. as, as much for us as that is good on from like a revenue standpoint, I think it's, it's good to know where uh, our global audiences have like a propensity to download things that we ask them to download, to go and play in, in areas that we say, hey, this is a good opportunity for you guys yeah. to go and yeah. you know, pull bonus bets, so on and so forth. As for the future of, I guess, affiliate first businesses, it's a really tough space because you see what happened with obviously like the DK and Penn deal. Um, you know, there's a different thing, you know, sorry, DK and Barstool. Yeah. Um, you know, you've got obviously like Twitter and the, the Ben and GM side powering yeah. odds. You've got Apple's just launched. Like, I think what you're going to find is a consolidation of media providers and mm -hmm. obviously the big sports books or the big fantasy providers, and they all sort of get in bed together. Like that's the date to the dance and they're going to, you know, skate off together, um, which makes it quite difficult, I think, for sort of smaller, either, you know, just entering or recently entered businesses on that side to do anything with, I guess, like long tail revenue upside on the affiliate base. So that's my take. Cool. Cool. Awesome. Well, Nick, this has been amazing. Uh, a couple, a couple of final questions, and we'll get you out of here. Uh, what's the future look like for Basketball Forever, or or just the Forever Network uh, in general? Um, you know, we've talked about these games. I'm assuming that's an immediate, you know, push for you guys. Outside of that, you know, what's the future look like? Uh, I don't know anything that it sticks in your mind. Are you guys utilizing tech and AI and things of that nature to really grow? Or that's a wide question. But what's the future look like for you guys? For sure, uh, the future for us, I think, is. Uh, launching of new media verticals. So um, baseball forever, football forever, hockey yep. forever, um, cool. full coverage of, of the four major US sports and then in time native product experiences for those sports as well. Um, we would love to continue growing, you know, our coverage of basketball to being best in class. We want to continue engaging at, at industry level rates and we want to be able to build, you know, a forever fantasy or a forever bet style, you know, product out to, you know, hundreds of thousands of users in different spots around the world who have a, a true litany of sort of like of games and, and product experiences to choose from every single night when they watch basketball or football or whatever it might be. So um, that's what probably drives us from, my, I guess, like a mission standpoint. Um, and also to prove out that there is a, a true path to acquiring users at, at very low cost uh, that doesn't require you to spend, you know, tens or hundreds of millions of dollars a quarter on, bonus bets and churning and um and you know what we've what we deem is sort of like a little bit of a broken business model for, for many companies that are operating in the space right now 
Sure. Sure. Awesome. Well, many of the people watching this are probably, you know, other business owners, other people in this space, in the sports media, or even iGaming, things of that nature. I'm curious what you guys, you know, not not every company has everything perfect. You know, there's always things that you may need. Um, what would be one, I guess, ask of the audience or one thing that maybe you're, you're looking for um, that you may want to just say to the you know, audience of this show? Yeah, I mean, we're new to the states, right? We've the the US has always been our biggest audience, or has been for you know the better part of a decade. We we speak to a lot of Americans every single month, a lot of Canadians every single month, and a lot of people in, as I said, Southeast Asia and Europe. Mm. Um, think of businesses that are trying to sort of get their name out, who are chasing eyeballs. I think that we have a history of doing extremely rich and valuable brand partnership work from like original content format ideas and different things on that side. So. An inbound ask is if that's something that's of interest to you, I'm always open to having conversations and our BD team is, is very creative on that side. And then from a, I guess, like a tech and product side, you know, we, we have a good, we have a good team. We, we know what we know. We don't know what we don't know. So I'm always open to talking to B2B partners, tech providers, um, you know, groups on the back end. And uh, I'll, I'll never, never turn down a conversation if you think that what you have is, is going to be helpful to us. Um, I think that that's that's been my sort of ethos for for business and and you know building community on, on that side. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Nick, thank you. How do people get a hold of you if they do want to talk to you? Uh, obviously, basketballforever.com is the URL to go check that out. Uh, what about getting a hold of you if they wanted to chat with you individually? Yeah, LinkedIn LinkedIn's probably the best for me, uh, or, or email um, and nk at forevernetwork.com. But uh, either of those, I'm, I'm super responsive and active. Awesome. We will put that in the show notes. We pulled up basketballforever.com here as well. Look at this awesome looking site. You guys do such a good job with graphics and things of that nature. So congrats on that. Um, great stuff, Nick. Really appreciate uh, you being here today. Uh, any last words before we let you go today? No, appreciate the time and, and looking forward to chatting with you again soon. Awesome, Nick. Good luck with everything. Talk to you soon. Have a great one. Uh, appreciate you listening to this uh, really educational. Uh, we can tell Nick is one of the sharp ones in the industry. So I encourage you to reach out to him if you have questions or you want to you know, do something with basketball forever. Uh, I'll put that email in the show notes. Uh, appreciate, uh, appreciate that. All right. Well, thanks for tuning in. That was episode 216 of the new sports show. We'll be back with 217 hopefully shortly. Uh, until then, uh, stay safe, take care, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. 